Tactical to practical. Tactical. Super ships project naval power around the world. It gives the president the capability to meet whatever threats available. Practical. Military technology guides ships into port. You can compare docking a, a large ship with parallel parking a skyscraper. Tactical. Armored vehicles built to last through the fiercest blast. I'm still a father, I'm still a husband because of the, you know, the vehicle I was in. Practical. Armored vehicles shield dignitaries from danger. The assailants will shoot at what they can see. Tactical. Simulators train fighting forces in a virtual battle. We depend a lot on the simulators for training. Practical. Simulators. Put the weapon down. Police practice getting the bad guys before crime occurs. They fall back in the training they have had in here. Keep your hands up. Tactical to practical. Developed for tactical advantage. Declassified for practical use. I'm Hunter Ellis aboard the USS John C. Stennis. It's great to be back on board this floating city with over 5,000 people, not to mention my old air wing, CAG-14. A carrier's a tactical platform that's unmatched. It's the king of the sea. Tactical. Super ships extend naval air power around the world. Carriers will be a dominant player in any future conflict. Practical. Super ships rely on military technology to move the world's cargo. I find it hard to understand how they actually did it before they had radar. The Stennis is one of our newest carriers. It's been a busy 10 years, traveling to and providing support for many operations around the globe. The Stennis is heading out again after months of action in the Arabian Sea, supporting American missions in both Afghanistan and Iraq. Her pilots have flown more than 10,000 combat sorties and have delivered 275,000 pounds of ordnance on their targets. The aircraft carrier combines air and sea power into one huge package, and that vision started not long after man first took flight. One of the first methods of launching planes at sea is from a ramp rigged above the gun turret. Some of the early carriers simply strapped flat decks on the top of old merchant ships with the superstructures swept off. In 1922, the USS Langley is retrofitted from a coal-carrying ship to become America's first official aircraft carrier. The Langley helps the U.S. Navy transport its aerial firepower across the world without having to worry about the consent of foreign powers. When the countries of this world decide that they do not want to allow us to operate, that means that we have to have a capability inherent in our Defense Department that allows us to operate unfettered by any restriction that might exist. One fundamental aspect of landing aircraft on a ship at sea has never changed. It's dangerous. There was a tremendous uh, amount of damage done to experimental aircraft and a lot of losses of pilots early on. Carrier landings have always been risky. Landing on a carrier is something that takes a lot of practice. Believe me, I know. Of my over 400 carrier landings, 10 of them were right here on the Stennis flight deck. It is truly a controlled crash. Taking off, you catapult it off the deck, and, and that's no easy thing, but it's a lot less dangerous than coming in for a landing. More than 80 aircraft are on board the Stennis, from surveillance and anti-submarine aircraft to the F-18E Super Hornet, the Navy's most deadly warfighter. To launch all these aircraft, the Stennis has four catapults available. 
When working at full capacity, planes can be launched into combat every 20 seconds. What goes on at flight deck level is controlled from on high. Primary flight control, or PryFly, is perched on top of the carrier superstructure, and the air boss who runs PryFly makes sense of all the chaos. Every 45 seconds, we have somebody showing up at the back end of the boat to land. That's about how long it takes us to go from the plane trapping to deconnecting from the wire, getting clear of the landing area, pull the wire back, and then reset it for whatever type of airplane's left. Landing on a carrier in the daytime is one thing. The night, that's a whole different story. Check it out. Flying at night can be scary. You're coming out through the sky and all you see is basically just a couple of lights that are out in the ocean. That's something that I don't think any pilot will get used to, but it's something that we need to do for, uh, for our missions. It's an awesome experience to sail on this airport at sea. Hard to believe that 97,000 tons of steel can even float. This truly is a city at sea. They have barbers, gyms, and even stores. But this is a warship, and it's worlds away from the comforts you'll find on one of the latest luxury liners. Cruise ships are not only outfitted with luxurious amenities, but also the latest commercial versions of military technologies like radar, GPS, and sonar. Necessities at sea that help vessels safely navigate the oceans of the world. Radar helps to see other ships on the water in any weather condition. GPS allows for precise navigation, and sonar is used to measure depth to keep ships from running aground. Perhaps the Titanic would still be around if it had radar to see that iceberg in its path. During World War II, the finest and fastest cruise ship on the seas is the Queen Mary. In 1940, she is stripped of her finery and serves in the Allied war effort, transporting thousands of troops into battle. Her speed and elusiveness earns her the nickname, the Grey Ghost. After the war, she continues transporting unarmed passengers in luxurious style until her final voyage in 1967 when she ports in Long Beach, California. She still resides there today and is one of the most popular tourist destinations in the world. A huge part of commercial shipping today are the tremendous tankers that carry billions of barrels of oil to fuel the world's economy and keep the U.S. military moving. Whether sailing on carriers, crews, or cargo ships, captains rely on satellite weather forecasts to see conditions along their route. We can actually predict not just one hour in advance of where the ship's going to be, 10 days in advance. So instead of making tactical decisions about uh, direction or heading that he would go on, he's able to now use a greater amount of information to make strategic decisions on the route. At sea, radar is used to locate ships and obstacles through darkness and foul weather. But when ships get close to port, they ultimately rely on human navigation. East to 10. Harbor pilots are known as bar pilots in the San Francisco Bay Area. They board and take the helm of large ships to guide them into port. San Francisco Bay is California's greatest natural harbor and the West Coast's most challenging waters. It's the job of the San Francisco bar pilots to know every inch of the bay. As if steering a huge ship into port wasn't challenging enough, just wait until you see how they get to work. Captain Nancy Wagner spends nine years at sea as a deck officer before becoming the first female bar pilot on the San Francisco Bay. When I get my call, two miles, showtime, you're on. There can be swells, 10, 15 feet. It can get pretty nasty out here. Bar pilots need to make a sometimes harrowing leap from the pilot boat to the ship's ladder, while both vessels are underway, often in rough seas. A missed step could be deadly. 
12 miles off the coast of San Francisco, or the approximate coordinates of 38 degrees north latitude and 123 degrees west longitude, there's a buoy where the bar pilots rendezvous with the big ships. Thanks to GPS, meeting up is a snap. This is the actual GPS unit. It tells us exactly where we are every time, no matter what the weather is. Satellite sends a signal down to this unit from several satellites. Liberty. Oh, Liberty. Osmond Yevik's life is on the water. He begins his ocean-going career nearly 50 years ago, shipping out on a Norwegian freighter when he's just 16 years old. Piloting is more, you got to know where the land is, and you got to have a, a really good idea where the ship is in relation to the land. But the GPS, of course, has made that so much easier. Now we're getting close. This is the Ming South. She's 904 feet long, a horizontal skyscraper. All we got to do is climb aboard. Ocean-going vessels are constantly challenged by Mother Nature, from killer storms to treacherous coastal waters. Military technologies like GPS and radar help ships stay on course. I'm on board one of the pilot boats belonging to the San Francisco Bar Pilots. These guys are also using radar technology to accomplish their mission of safely guiding civilian vessels into harbor. This technology takes a lot of the guesswork out of their job, especially in bad weather and at night. South. This is the pilot boat California Channel 13. So right now we're in a 12 mile scale with two nautical mile rings, right? This shows our position here in the middle. And this is the coastline. You can see it's dipping back here toward the Golden Gate Bridge. So how has radar helped the job of the bar pilots? Funny and hard to understand how they actually did it before they had radar. I guess in the old days when it was foggy, ships didn't come in, but now they go day and night, fog or no fog, it doesn't matter. Just getting to these boats can be quite a challenge. Now we got to climb on board. Getting on board was a little trickier than I thought, but the bar pilots make it look easy. Once on board, though, the hard work really begins. I'm just watching everything line up and how the ship is going to react once I give her some rudder here. Port 20. Port 20. Port 20. It's one thing to navigate in peaceful waters. Now, imagine doing it during combat. Carriers are deployed to all the hot spots around the world. They can be literally anywhere on the planet in a few weeks. It gives the president the capability of, of moving an aircraft uh, platform into any area of the world where he needs it to project uh, whatever kind of power he wants to project. The Stennis is CVN-74. That means it's the 74th carrier built by the US and it's part of the nuclear-powered Nimitz class. Of course, the name Nimitz and aircraft carriers have been linked since World War II. Admiral Chester Nimitz is named Commander-in-Chief of the US Navy's Pacific Fleet in World War II after the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor. The US fleet is severely crippled. Luckily, all of the Navy's aircraft carriers are at sea on exercises. After decoding enemy messages, Nimitz deploys his carriers, the Enterprise, the Hornet, and the Yorktown, to surprise the Japanese at the Battle of Midway. Think of it as launching a couple of hundred cruise missiles at a small number of ships all at once. It simply overloaded the Japanese defenses. They were able to stop our torpedo bombers, but the dive bombers came in and sank in minutes three of their carriers, and then later on, the fourth. The Battle of Midway turns the tide in the Pacific. After this key victory, the US Navy and its fleet of aircraft carriers rule supreme. And to remain supreme, today's carriers come with a posse, the carrier battle group. With cruisers, destroyers, submarines, and frigates, 
the battle group can destroy literally any enemy at sea, in the air, or on land. When you bring the synergies of all that capability together, you get something that's pretty much in invulnerable from the perspective of conventional warfare. The U.S. Navy is also a networked Navy. With the latest communication technology, today's Navy can be much more flexible in its battle plans. Over Afghanistan, for example, three out of four aircraft that sortied off of the deck were sent out with no target whatsoever. Their job was to hook up with the special forces network in the field in Afghanistan, and they would then decide together what they'd be attacking. The next generation of aircraft carriers will be the nuclear-powered CVX class. These new ships will require fewer operators and have more powerful and faster elevators and catapults. The Navy claims this can significantly increase the number of sorties per day. We're docking the Ming South here in the Port of Oakland. It's the job of the San Francisco bar pilots to make sure it gets done safely. I think you could compare docking a, a large ship with parallel parking a skyscraper. Sometimes there is definitely a fear factor there, and between the fog and the weather and the traffic patterns with small boat traffic, there's a lot of unknowns that you have to, to deal with, and so you're, you're thinking on your feet all the time. Stop engine. So our plan now is just to get the ship positioned in the proper space. Do you stop here? and then turn it? So, well, we'll start turning just a little bit before we stop. Tugboats enter the narrow channel and are used to turn the huge cargo ship around to prepare it for docking. But docking is no easy chore. One mistake could damage several thousand tons of goods. The U.S. military travels the oceans, projecting naval and aerial firepower around the world. The world's largest civilian ships move the goods of the globe. Even in open water, navigation can be a challenge. The San Francisco bar pilots steer thousands of huge ships through the dangerous Golden Gate every year. One slip up could be disastrous. A ship captain can cross thousands of miles at sea on a typical voyage. But the most challenging part of the journey is the last few feet. You could be bringing a mass of, say, in the neighborhood of 100,000 tons along alongside a fixed object. And uh, you know that's a lot of momentum, a lot of inertia to overcome. It doesn't take much to go wrong before you could have damage. Dead slow astern. Osman, nice job. I am thoroughly impressed. Oh, thank you. You gonna give me the keys next time? Yeah. <laughs> OK. Super ships keep the US Navy fighting its battles at sea and in the air. And thanks to military technology, modern civilian navigation is safer today for cargo and crew. Tactical, military armored vehicles protect war fighters under fire. It's almost awe inspiring knowing how much blast we took and everybody walked away. Practical, civilian armored cars. A mix of hardened steel and high technology. The philosophy of armoring vehicles came from the military application to the civilian sector. January 2003, Staff Sergeant David Wall is leading a Special Forces convoy down a desolate Afghan road. What he doesn't know is that his armored Humvee is about to be tested. Slow down, slow down. Jesus Christ. Two separate explosions rock the vehicles. This one, caught on tape, is only a partial detonation. A blast 30 times more powerful goes off under the Humvee Sergeant Wall is riding in.
all this fragmentation came up toward us as well as the vehicle was kicking up almost vertically on its rear end. The Humvee is completely destroyed. Its radiator lands on this ledge some 20 yards away. Amazingly, all five soldiers on board survive with only minor injuries. I would assume at least three of us would have been killed without a doubt. But this isn't your standard military Humvee. The entire passenger compartment of this special vehicle is wrapped in armor, a feature wall credits with saving his life. It's a good feeling knowing that I, I, I was able to come home. Uh, I've got two small kids. It, it kind of gives you that, that lump in your throat thinking how, how close you could have been uh, to not being here. These life-saving Humvees roll out of the Ogara, Hess, and Eisenhart's Ohio factory at a rate of more than 60 a month. Fitted with 1,300 pounds of armor, these vehicles are ready for war. But this same company also builds civilian armored cars, a combination of hardened steel and high-tech ballistic materials that offers the ultimate in personal protection. This Lincoln Town Car may look like your standard luxury limo, but the elegant exterior hides an armored inner shell that can stop a 44 Magnum. Modern day fear of everything from domestic terrorism to random acts of violence is driving a booming market for civilian armored cars. But armored vehicles have been proving their mettle on the battlefield since the early days of World War I. When you think of armored military vehicles, you probably think tanks. From the crude British tanks of World War I, through the mighty M1A2 Abrams, one of the world's most heavily armored vehicles. But a new generation of lightweight armored vehicles is offering troops some level of ballistic protection, but is still light enough for rapid deployment from a C-130. These light armored vehicles can stop bullets from a 50 caliber machine gun. Banks and bad guys see the practical advantages of vehicle armor. By the early 1920s, steel-plated delivery trucks are used to carry cash, giving banks a fighting chance against would-be robbers. And for 1930s outlaw Al Capone, a bulletproof Cadillac helps guard against occupational hazards. Today, a growing number of civilian VIPs are shelling out more than a hundred grand for a custom-built, personal armored car. If you're a high-profile celebrity and you have people that are stalking you, uh, if you're a wealthy businessman that perhaps um, have entities that are interested in your wealth or don't like what you've done. And just how much firepower can these cars take? Protection levels range from handgun to high-powered rifle. So how do you turn a standard SUV into a mobile armored fortress? First, strip the vehicle down to bare metal. Then, add a bullet-tight inner skin of hardened steel and composite fiber armor. For maximum protection, armor placement is critical. For example, this ballistic steel overlap is used to shield the area where the window glass meets the door frame. But a well-armored vehicle is a compromise between ballistic protection and vehicle performance. Too much armor can increase a car's weight by more than a ton. If you overburden your vehicle with too much weight, you can compromise your ability to escape. A builder of bullet-stopping civilian cars since 1942, Ogara, Hess, and Eisenhart knows the formula well. Maximize ballistic protection, minimize vehicle weight. They say much of their civilian armored car technology goes into these military armored Humvees. Result, a vehicle that's tough enough to take on a landmine and light enough to fly in a C-130. That means when rapid deployment is essential, these vehicles are good to go. And while these military Humvees are packing some civilian armored car technology, 
Today's civilian armored cars rely on materials proven on the battlefield. The Kevlar Line 4 of the civilian SUV is designed to stop shrapnel from an assassin's hand grenade. Today, civilian armored cars are proving an even newer generation of high-tech ballistic protection materials. This Toron fabric stops a 44 Magnum. Even tougher, this ballistic steel and spectra fiber composite can take on an AK-47. Probably the most important part of the armoring package is the transparent armor because assailants will shoot at what they can see. So they're gonna shoot at you through the glass. In the windows of this SUV are more than an inch of glass, acrylic, and polycarbonate layers. Here's a piece of rifle level protection glass. Whoa! <laughs> How much does this weigh? This weighs uh, between 60 and 70 pounds. Oh my God. Now, let's see if this transparent armor can stand up to the firepower of an M16. Check this out. That's what I call bullet resistant glass. If you're still worried about shaking the bad guys, Utah's International Armoring Corporation may have just the ticket. It's designed to look just like a regular Suburban, but it has some bells and whistles on it. It's, uh, it's got a Rotac dispenser, for example. That's right. This vehicle's packing 28 tire popping road tacks. So these drop out the back, and how is it activated? Simple as pressing a button. On the dash, you press a button, and these will drop out the exactly. back and slice open tires. Exactly. Can we test it out? Sure, we can make that happen. All right, let's give it a shot. The road tacks are locked, loaded, and ready to fire. And the chase vehicle is hot on my tail. So let's see if we can shred some tires. Here goes. Tacks away. A technology born on the battlefields of World War I, armored vehicles protect soldiers under fire. and help civilian VIPs escape an assassin's bullet. This armored SUV is packing a secret weapon. At the flick of a switch, I can drop 28 razor-sharp road tacks. Can they stop a determined chase vehicle? There's only one way to find out. Dan, what happened? I think I got a flat. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like it. The tax only got one tire, but that might be just enough to slow a chasing vehicle. Now, the road tax may not be for everyone, but it looks like armored cars might be going mainstream. Lincoln and Cadillac say armored versions of their luxury sedans will be in dealerships by mid-2004. It's a statement that the demand, for one, is not only increasing, but it's not gonna go away. Tactical, military mobile armor, battlefield heavyweights that take on the enemy's best shot, and a new generation of vehicles with the light weight to get troops quickly into a war zone and the tough skin that can get them back home alive. Practical, civilian armored cars, average looks, hide a tough as nails inner shell. They're built to stop a killer's bullet and leave would-be assassins in the dust. Put down the weapon and come on out. Tactical, simulators. Pilots train in the virtual world before putting their lives on the line. We depend a lot on the simulators for training uh, and they kind of get you ready for the cockpit. Practical, 
Simulators put ordinary people at the controls of their own 737 jets. Here you can do things you couldn't do in the real airplane. When most people think of simulators, they think of something like this. But pilots need to learn more than just how to fly. They also need to know what to do when something goes wrong. When I went through ejection seat training with the Navy, we learned the basics and pray that we would never have to use it. But now, there's new technology that actually allows pilots to see what they might be facing. You remember to drill. This is the Navy's new virtual reality parachute simulator. To experience just how it works, I was handed a set of VR goggles, and soon I was seeing the world from 4,000 feet above the ground, virtually. See if I can steer this baby a little bit. Right. Remember, this isn't a sport parachute. You want to watch your body position on this. Make sure you don't turn sideways. When you turn sideways into the wind, you'll start swinging a little bit. Man, this is light years ahead of what we had. Wow, this is cool. Eyes on the horizon, elbows in, up on your risers, feet and knees together. Boosh, there we go. On the deck. Safe and sound, yes. One piece, that's all that matters. <laughs> Pilots can get virtual in almost every aspect of flight training. Believe it or not, it's something the military has been doing for more than 70 years. 1931. The birth of the modern-day military simulator arrives when Edwin Link designs and patents the pilot trainer. The machine is later coined the Link Trainer, and thousands of U.S. and British airmen use them during World War II. The basic goal of those early trainers was to get you used to flying by instruments and flying by some feel, because they'd have some mechanics in it, so it would tilt you the right way as you moved. But it isn't until the PC revolution kicks into high gear in the early 80s that the military starts using simulations as tactical training tools. One of their partners in this endeavor is the video game industry. The defense guys had the technology, and they could build you nice, OK graphics, but it wasn't very immersive. And what I mean by immersive is that it didn't grab you and make you believe you're, you're in this particular engagement. It was really the gaming industry that was, was making that happen. Still, the limited graphics power makes these military simulators less than perfect. It will take another 10 years before the graphics technology is advanced enough to make simulations realistic. A lot of times the old technology in flight simulation was animation creating fake hills, fake plants, fake trees, what have you, and then flying through the, the hillsides. 1993, software maker Microsoft releases Flight Simulator 5.0 for civilian use, arming weekend warriors with a new sim that incorporates photorealistic and satellite imagery for its graphics. Today, Thousands of gamers play the popular sim, but some are taking it to the extreme. Meet James Price. Check out his simulator, a fully loaded Boeing 737 cockpit, wired with a working instrument panel and the latest flight simulator software projected onto a giant video screen. The sim is powered by a Pentium 4 processor, and the software interfaces directly with the jet's steering, gauges, and switches. Hey, clear for takeoff. 80 knots. V1, rotate. Positive ready to climb, gear up. Price stores it in his California airport hangar. This is the ultimate Sim Freak simulator. His cost to build it? A cool 60,000 bucks but a bargain compared to the airline's million-dollar simulators. And I've flown in the uh, full-motion multi-million-dollar simulators enough to know that this is pretty close. Price has been flying for 20 years and loves every minute of it, but it's the action inside his simulator that really gets his heartbeat racing. It's very, very exhilarating because you've got the sound, you've got the motion, you've got the visuals. Turn back to the airport now and do a landing. You've got the interaction with the controls. Flaps up, final, gear down. So there's a lot of dynamics going on in it that really makes it fun to sit down and actually fly it as if it were a real airline flight from gate to gate.
And we are back in San Francisco. I'm at the MOVES Institute at the Naval Postgraduate School in Monterey, California. MOVES stands for Modeling of Virtual Environment Simulations. These are the guys that specialize in providing the new training technologies to the military. We work in networked virtual environments. How do you use game engines? How do you do web-based 3D? So we work very much in that arena. You're looking at the latest in sharpshooting sims. The ISMT, or ISMIT, stands for Indoor Simulated Marksmanship Trainer, and it's used by the military to prepare soldiers for battle. How does this compare to the real thing? I mean, what is this training scenario like? The ISMIT is, first and foremost, a technical trainer. It teaches operation of the weapon. And the weapon is a modified M16A2, firing three round bursts with a recoil that is close to that of a real weapon. The ISMT is the real deal. And this Marine Corps Major is definitely a good shot. The question is, how will I perform under fire? Simulators prepare the military before they get on the battlefield. And train law enforcement officers for split-second decision-making in times of crisis. Put your hands up. The Military Sharpshooting Simulator, or ISMT, is created in 1991. It's developed to train Marines for real combat missions that they may have to face in battle. Possible avenues of approach. All right, I may be an aviator, but I fired a weapon before, so uh, you ready to uh, whip up on me a bit? Sure. All right, let's bring it on. All right, we're going into a building. There are probably enemy, possibly non-combatants. You have to be able to distinguish between them and react. Okay. If they could come through a door. Well, you, want to be, you want to be aiming right there. Right. Always maintain awareness. And we come around, we sweep the area. All right, wide open area. Wide open area. Look to so the left open. and to the right. They could come okay. from any direction. Now we're okay, there's an the obstacle there. That, stand by. Shooter. Yeah, I mean, they just jump up out of nowhere. That's wild. Exactly. While the ISMT is a surefire hit for the military, sharpshooting sims are also being used extensively by police officers. At the San Francisco Police Academy, recruits and officers prepare on the firearms training system, otherwise known as FATS. Here's the scenario. Jim Petri is working the day watch. He is a one-man unit. He takes the call from dispatch that there's an unstable citizen with a gun. Get the hell out of here! Put the weapon down. Come out with your hands up. Put down the weapon and come on out. You guys want a show? Drop the weapon. We'll give you a show. Put it down. You want hostile negotiators out there? It'd be helpful, please, if you can get them to respond. I'll really do it. I'll really do it. People out there suddenly realize when the crisis inevitably does hit that they may not have time to come up with a plan, so they fall back in the training they've had in here. OK, hold on. I think he's going to put the weapon down. Hold on. OK, put your hands where we can see him. Hands up. Come on, step away from the weapon. And across the San Francisco Bay in Alameda County, instructors train police officers with vehicle simulators. Today, they're training officers on dignitary protection. Your dignitary is going to be right here at 19th and 7th. As you approach there, you're going to see a person standing on the sidewalk, and that, that's the person we want you to pick up. Officers must act fast and decisively to save the diplomat from being harmed. Got something behind you. Got hey, what's going on? Whoa, oh, Gary, go. Hey, what's going go on. on here? Just sit back. What's going on? It enables you to, to practice what you should be doing on the street. Just hold on. We'll be OK. In this case, their opponent, otherwise known as the rabbit, is able to take out the police and kill the driver and official. Luckily for this officer, it's just a simulator. Oh! oh. We're dead. Officers then put the pedal to the metal, taking their simulation training to a live track. 
we practice skills out here, we marry it with decision making in there. And what you end up having is a highly trained driver that knows what their abilities are, knows the extent of, uh, of their abilities, those of the vehicle and the road that they're uh, driving on. Navy pilots aboard the John C. Stennis don't have the opportunity to fly every day. That's why the military is now turning to high-tech simulators for some realistic training. And one high-tech company that's helping with their development is Silicon Graphics International in Mountain View, California. SGI is testing cutting-edge simulation technology at their virtual reality center. Pilots simulate the exact missions they may be called on to fly. On board the Abraham Lincoln, we used to plan missions using computers and PowerPoint. But this is the ultimate mission planning tool. This is the wave of the future. In mission rehearsal, we want to create the worst of situations. Uh, you know, maybe a beautiful day when we actually fly the mission, but what happens if the weather's bad? So we're able to change, as you can see behind you, we can make it day into night, night into day, create bad weather, lightning storms, what have you. So when we fly it on the simulator, we can see the worst of situations. So it doesn't surprise us when we actually go do it for real. Whether for military or civilian use, software makers are constantly dreaming up new ways to make these sims more realistic. At Cyberware in Monterey, California, they actually scan people with lasers to turn them into virtual characters. We try and capture a very precise uh, texture map, that's the color of the subject, and very, very precise 3D measurements of the subject so that the action figure or the simulation is as lifelike as possible. The next step is to capture my body movement. This is done with a technique called motion capture. There's a bunch of cameras all around me that are tracking these little markers on my suit. Once their position's fed into the computer, it knows exactly what I'm doing. Motion capture is now widely used throughout the video game industry to make computer simulations more realistic. Video game maker Electronic Arts uses full teams of players to make its sport sims more accurate. And they even created a new cyber warrior, Hunter Ellis. U.S. troops in Iraq are faced with the task of keeping the peace in an unfamiliar country. Back at the Moves Institute, researchers are creating less action-oriented sims, but sims that are still essential for saving lives. This is their 3D Online Mentors program, a language sim for soldiers in Iraq, so they can learn to better communicate before stepping on foreign soil. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. We can take a virtual model of uh, of Baghdad and say this is exactly where you're going you're going to be manning this checkpoint and this is the kind of interaction you'll probably have here's the list of words you might want to know and then let's go into this 3D world and try them out simulators prepare the military for combat mentally and physically Shooter. Simulators make police officers better able to protect and serve on civilian streets. Really Simulators, tactical to practical. We're ready to climb gear up. Tactical, super ships, aerial firepower from the sea. Practical, super ships, mammoth cargo carriers steer clear in tight spots. Tactical, armored vehicles, virtually unstoppable on tracks or tires. Practical, armored vehicles, high-tech protection for high-profile civilians. Tactical, simulators, pilots trained for dangerous maneuvers in virtual safety. Practical, simulators, ultimate sims give gamers electronic wings. Tactical to practical. Technology moving from government deployment to everyone's enjoyment.